Welcome to The Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to The Table. We discuss issues of God and culture. I'm Daryl Bach, Executive Director for Cultural Engagement at the Hendricks Center at Dallas Theological Seminary. And our topic today is discipleship and pastoral leadership, and my guest is someone who uh, I've known for a long time and who has had a stellar um, career in ministry, Gene Getz, uh, who is former pastor at Fellowship Church, former faculty member at Dallas Seminary, came to Dallas uh, through Moody, and uh, just it's a real pleasure to have you with us, Gene. Well, thanks, Daryl, and uh, thanks for the opportunity. Yeah. So we're going to be discussing discipleship and church leadership, and, and my opening question is always the same. How did a guy like you get into a gig like this? How in the world did you get started? This is 50-plus years of doing uh, this kind of ministry. How did you get started in, in your work? And I'm thinking about going all the way back to your training. Well, um, I left the farm in Indiana to go to Moody Bible Institute in Chicago. I didn't know my right hand from my left, basically, and uh, came out of a sect, basically, that was uh, had a lot of false theology, and I didn't have the assurance of my salvation, even at Moody. But a professor took an interest in me and saw potential and uh, believed in me and he said, Gene, I want you to go on for more education, and uh, someday maybe you could come back and teach here. Well, that kind of went in, went in one ear and out the other, Daryl, but uh, I, I did go on for more education, went to Montana, was in ministry there, radio and uh, music, and uh, this professor stayed in contact with me, came back and entered the Wheaton Graduate School, and uh, started teaching at Moody part-time, and I didn't know where all that is going to lead, but, uh, uh, and you'll be fascinated with this because they needed a course in the evening school in media. Hmm. I told this professor, I said, you know, uh, I'm not sure I'm qualified, and he said, well, maybe you can take a course in the undergraduate school at Wheaton while you're in the graduate school on media, and then teach it here at Moody in the evening school. <laughs> and that's how I got started. And uh, in 1956, I joined the faculty full time. I think, Daryl, I was the youngest member of the faculty. I was 23 when I started teaching at Moody. I had students older than I was that had been in the war. And uh, it was a great growth experience. And little did I realize that I would go on and get my Ph.D. at New York University, and one day the phone rang, and it was Howard Hendricks on the other end of the line saying, Gene, I'd love to have you join me as my associate at Dallas. Would you consider that? And at first I was hesitant because I was part of the brick and mortar at Moody, really. Hmm. I'd already moved into administration. And um, then Dr. Wolver Wolverd called me in. And uh, because I wasn't even going to come down and take a look at it, and he said, you owe yourself just to at least come down here. And I did, and uh, three days later, we were already building a home in Dallas. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, that, 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 that's amazing. I mean, that's amazing. I didn't know about the media piece of that. That's very, very interesting. Neither did I know that you spent time at Wheaton in the Wheaton Graduate School. So that's very, very interesting in terms yeah, of preparation. Well, Merle Tenney was um, fantastic, uh, as you know, New Testament scholar, and uh, his approach to biblical studies was incredibly influential in my life. And, uh, and I got my PhD at NYU with a lot of work in historical research. Hmm. And when I put together what I was getting at NYU in historical research with uh, the, uh, the just watching Tenney and hearing him and being in those classes and uh, 
watching him do biblical theology, following the unfolding story, just impacted me tremendously. And I would say that that was foundational to my tackling these two uh, study Bibles. Interesting. So, um, uh, and and actually, you almost stole my next question, which is um, how foundational um, biblical studies and biblical theology, in particular, I think, has been in your own particular ministry. Um, obviously, flowing also into expository preaching and and the emphases that you brought it uh, to fellowship. Talk a little bit about the origins of Fellowship Church as well. Let's let's talk a little bit about that. Well, that, that goes back to Dallas, because um, you remember back in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, a lot of upheaval in our in our culture. Mm -hmm. uh, middle of the uh, Vietnam War, um, free speech movement, um, rebelling against institutional uh, uh, forms and structures. And I had students in the class who had been converted, I think, maybe through crusade, had no background in ecclesiology. But they, you remember those days, they encouraged them to go to seminary. And I had uh, one guy in class one day, and I was teaching this introductory course, assuming knowledge of the church and belief in the church. And he said, you know, who needs the church? Maybe God's going to bypass the church. Hmm. Well, I knew that was not accurate. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jesus said, I'll build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. But I found that there were other students in the class that had been influenced by the culture tremendously. And so consequently, um, I did something I've never done before, never have since. I sometimes think I was nuts, but uh, students did too. But I came to the class, middle of the semester, told them to tear up the syllabus, told them that I had not prepared the class to answer their questions. I said, we're going to go back to the syllabus, namely the Great Commission. Hmm. We're going to follow the unfolding of that commission in the book of Acts and on into the epistles, where they wrote to the churches that were founded in the book of Acts. And uh, we're going to go as far as we can with the rest of the semester. And uh, boy, that was a challenge because that was on a Thursday. And on a Tuesday, we were meeting again. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, I went down to the seminary up there on the fourth floor of Davidson. And I, I just took out my Bible. And these were pre-computer days. I, I just built some columns. How did they go and make disciples in the book of Acts? Mm -hmm. And uh, what happened And uh, in, in the area of evangelism, making disciples and then building those disciples? And so I just began to note in these columns how it happened. And uh, when the sun went down, I'd gotten halfway through the New Testament. I was pretty motivated, as you can imagine. Yeah. And uh, I went back on Sunday and did the same thing and finished the New Testament. Hmm. I had 25 pages, single space, of just Scripture. Hmm. And I got that all ready and handed it out on Tuesday and said, guys, here's what I've been doing on the weekend. I want you to take what I've done and go through it very carefully and color code and Underscore, how did they make disciples? You know, what resulted? Then how did they build the disciples? And uh, so they, we looked at the functions and the activities in the book of Acts and went right on into the epistles, which become now directives and exhortations to the churches and the results of that. And we just went through that process and began to move right on through until as far as we could go. Next semester, I picked up where I left off. And, uh, well, we had to start over, obviously, but I had a lot more time. There were two-hour classes. You remember Phil Hook? Oh, yes. Phil, bless his heart, he was so interested in this, what I was doing, that he came in, volunteered to sit in my class, mm 
several semesters. And what I had him do, I did these lectures based on this biblical research and asked him the second hour to evaluate my lectures. Hmm. And the students loved it, and Phil enjoyed it. And it was an encouragement to me because I saw Phil was learning too, and he was from the theology department. Yes. I was in CE. And then eventually I brought uh, Dr. Peters in to debate Zane Hodges on form and function. Hmm. And Peters won hands down every time. <laughs> Hmm. Zane, by the way, was well, he was a, a real gentleman. And uh, after the process, and I eventually wrote Sharpening the Focus of the Church, Zane actually came to me and told me the things that he had learned about the church uh, going through that process. You know, that process uh, never, never left you, um, because I'm thinking about some of the other books that you did, the Measure of a Man, Measure of a Church, that kind of thing, which basically had the same kind of approach, just working your way systematically through the Scripture with a biblical theology, and I very focused on the topic that you were presenting. And so, obviously, the Scripture was very foundational and is very foundational to the way you approach discipleship. It was both relational and content related, and you you combine those uh, together in a very effective way. Even naming a church with the term fellowship shows the relational side of what you were doing. So, talk about that relationship a little bit. The combination of relational and content. I like to tell people that the church needs to get refocused on what I call the two greats: the Great Commission and the Great Commandment. And if they can stay focused in those two places, um, then that will that will keep you pretty pretty focused on, on you know that and knowing, of course, who God is. That'll keep you pretty focused on where you ought to be going. Yeah, and I agree a hundred percent. The um, actually, what happened is that there were several families that heard about these dynamic discussions. And by the way, I have to throw something in here. You'll love this, Daryl. But Walford called me in one day, and he said, Getz, he said, I'm getting some uh, negative feedback from a few on what you're doing in the class. And I said, well, I said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I have the hard copy of Sharpening. It's at Moody Press. I said, I'll get it, and you can read it, and that'll give you the essence of it. He said, I like that. I got it to him on a Friday. He gave it back to me the next week, and he said, Gene, there's nothing in here I disagree with. He said, but let me give you a little practical advice. He said, just uh, throw something in for the traditionalists to keep them happy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, classic Dr. Walbert. Yeah. I was home free. I knew that. Yeah, yeah. And, um, very encouraged. And uh, actually, I had him preach at the original fellowship. I still remember that. And uh, he preached on oil in the Middle East. Remember that little book he wrote? Yeah. Uh, boy, we had people sitting on the floor, and I think we had four services going, and people eating it up and buying his books. And he said, Gene, Afterwards, he said, God's at work here. Mm -hmm. well, that was a thrill. But anyway, what happened is these families found out about what was going on at the seminary because, you know, some people thought I kind of lost my mind, I think. And some of the profs, because we went to one major two and a half hour service, you know, canceled midweek services that we were shortcutting and uh, going liberal, I guess. And I talked with them and helped clarify it. In fact, even Stan Toussaint had questions. He ended up pastoring. <laughs> which, <laughs> but um, uh, we started, and back to your basic question. Uh, I was very impressed with the succinct outline that Luke recorded in Acts 2.42 mm -hmm. and following. They continued in the Apostles' teaching. Obviously, that was the Holy Spirit uh, unveiling Scripture and truth. Uh, 
to Peter and the apostles as he promised the Holy Spirit would do in John 14, 15, 16. And eventually that became the word, the New Testament. So we've got to continue there. That's foundational. They continued in fellowship, which he referred to the relational dimension. You know, breaking bread, and that was more than just eating. That was remembering the Lord, mm -hmm. you know, with agape. And uh, continuing in prayer, which was a whole new experience, to have a high priest that they could go to the Father. And um, continuing prayer for one another, uh, continuing in uh, uh, sharing. And, of course, in that dynamic uh, they cared for each other, and um, and then they they praised the Lord, and then it says they had favor with all the people, and all the people were those who were looking in on all this that was happening, because the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So you have the three dimensions there of the word fellowship with God and one another, and I see those interrelated. Yep. And then uh, evangelism or outreach. And, and what was happening was what Jesus said would happen. And what he prayed for is when they saw the love and unity, um, that became the basic apologetic to convince them that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. Yeah, and, you know, the, um, I, I often like to say that uh, the Bible is built around an ethical triangle, which is the better you relate to God, the better position you are to relate to others. And, uh, and that that is intentional. I, I like to draw people's attention to a passage in Luke where John the Baptist is preparing a people for the coming of the Lord, and it says he's going to turn Israel back to God, and he's going to turn the fathers back to their children and the disobedient to the just. And so, you know, normally we think a prophet's role is to turn someone back to God, but in John the Baptist's case, in preparing a people, he's doing both. He's turning people back to God so they're in a position to relate to one another better. Um, and really the core of discipleship and following following God and being a learner who, who follows in the way of God, which is the essence of what this meaning a disciple is, um, is designed to, to have us reflect the character of God and the care of God and the love of God and the grace of God and the kindness of God and the justice of God and the righteousness of God. There are lots of aspects to that. But that, re that relational dimension is so important. And I sometimes think in conservative churches, we're so committed to being right, we forget the relational base of what we ought to be about and the way in which that relational base and that community that we build actually becomes the magnet, as you were suggesting, of what it is that draws people to the Lord, because they see people living in a different way than they're used to in the world, and that becomes attractive. Right, and that's exactly what Jesus prayed for hmm. when he was on, <clears throat> excuse me, this uh, COVID has gotten to my vocal cords, so can you hear me okay? I can hear you fine. <clears throat> okay, uh, but he prayed that uh, for love and unity so that they would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And you remember the late Dr. Francis Schaeffer wrote uh, the church at the end of the 20th century. He called that the final apologetic. And I love that, what Jesus prayed for. But anyway, to answer your question, so there were several people that found out about what we were doing invited Elaine and me to come and share in a home. Don Kerr, I don't know if you remember Don, hmm. was on the faculty or us, the board at Dallas, too. He was a businessman, and we met in his home, about eight couples. I shared the essence of those three experiences, and, uh, and I said the thing that the church needs to do is to look at those three experiences and then uh, those are the absolutes. Then look at their forms, the non-absolutes, and say, what do we need to change to have people have these three experiences in Dallas right now in this century? And uh, they said, well, would you come and help us start a church? Hmm. 
and that's how it got started. Interesting. You know, uh, uh, I, I know that one of the things that you definitely developed a reputation for, you alluded to it nicely in talking about your little visit with Dr. Walbert and the negative feedback that you were getting, was your ability to innovate uh, in terms of um, in, in terms of the way in which church was done without altering the core commitments of what a church is supposed to be. And so we talk, I said we'd talk about discipleship and church leadership. This is more the church leadership side of things. And I guess I have a two-part question. One is, um, what led you to, to think about that kind of a distinction on the one hand, and what advice would you give to churches today that often get caught in the middle of the same debate? You know, in, in my career, we've been through, you know, the worship wars with music styles and format and that kind of stuff, where that has created sometimes some tension in the church. And obviously, you describe what the 60s are like. I think the period that we're in is, is the closest thing to the 60s that I've seen in my lifetime since, and, uh, and, and, and just the same kind of battles. It seems like we have to go through the same space generationally on a regular basis just to remind ourselves uh, where we are and where we ought to be. Um, so talk a little bit about that. Talk about um, the way in which you handled and evaluated, I think would be also a good part of this question, um, the idea of innovation in determining what you could do that would be innovative and creative and speak to the moment on the one hand, and yet what needed to remain so that you were faithful to what Scripture was asking on the other. Well, Darrell, that was the essence of that debate between Peters and uh, Hodges. Is there absolute form in Scripture or just absolute function? Peters took the position only absolute function. And that was aligning with what we were discovering in the research we were doing, just with the students, and um, and and uh, and so consequently, when we started the first fellowship church, I I outlined for that small group, and eventually for the elders, eventually for the church, that God has given us the absolute functions, such as those three experiences but gives us the freedom and form so that we can apply this anywhere in the world. For example, you remember Musa Asaki? Yeah, sure. Uh, I was in Nigeria. I was in the bush with him, with his tribal group, the Hausa. And I, was, I had 300 pastors, 300 wives. And I stood up and I taught them Acts 242 through 47. I didn't talk about what we were doing in Dallas. I talked about what was happening in Jerusalem. And I pointed out these were three experiences we can have today. But then I had Musa come up behind me. We had agreed to this. And he then picked up in the house of language, summarized those three experiences. And for an hour, they talked to each other about how they could apply those three experiences there in the bush, actually, in Nigeria. Now, that's, that's what I think the Holy Spirit designed for us. Because if he gave us absolutes in form, he would lock us into Jerusalem or into the Middle East. But he's given us his freedom to take the gospel and carry out the Great Commission around the world and develop the forms that are necessary. And that's what I shared with the people. I said, let's do that here in Dallas. That, so that's that, that's I, interesting. You know, uh, I like to tell people, so who tells us that we have to have three hymns, that we have to have a, a bulletin, uh, uh, you know, what the style of – where is that in the Bible? Nowhere. You know, no, Exactly. That's the point. And, yeah. and, and so, so the way in which you reach people with uh, biblical truth, uh, the way in which you form your community, and the way in which you serve in that community so that people can see that God cares. The one point I like to say is, is that, you know, when we preach and teach, 
through our words that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, if we don't model that kind of service to those on the outside in the way that we engage, uh, that somehow we're, we're failing to deliver on God's message, which is not only to be heard, but it's to be seen. And, and, and so um, thinking through how the church can do that in their own community, um, both building up the saints on the one hand and yet on the other hand equipping them so that they're able to serve and, and, and take the gospel to a, to a needy community is at the core of what a church is supposed to be. And a lot of times what I see are churches have become uh, holy huddles and, and kind of safe places to, to not engage with people outside the church. And then I ask, well, how then can you accomplish the Great Commission? Because the Great Commission doesn't say, go into the church and make disciples. It says, go into the world and make disciples. Uh, and, and so uh, just thinking about uh, how the church balances its nurture of its of its membership, its um, its commitment to growth and discipleship on the one hand, but that discipleship is always outward reaching and always moving in a direction towards people who need what the gospel has to offer. And I think that's the essence of what a church is supposed to be. Well, I, I agree, and you've summarized it uh, with a different, little different spin, but saying the same thing. And uh, the same thing is true with music. You see, it's very interesting because we have some dear brothers and sisters in Christ who are instrument, non-instrumentalists. I was one of those growing up in a, in a religious sect, and I'm not equating the two because ours was very works-oriented. It was a acapella church. But the thing that I think they miss there in terms of, of, of music is that God in the Old Testament was working with a stable culture of Israelites who had their own perspectives on music. David did, and, uh, uh, you know, through the Psalms, and they had all this instrumental background uh, with the walls being built and the, rebuilt and so forth, with the choirs. However, when you get to the New Testament, the Holy Spirit, I believe, <clears throat> purposely left out any reference to instrumentality because that's a lot of that is cultural. But the thing that is enduring is to teach one another with psalms. That's content. With, you know, spiritual songs, spiritual odes, hymns, making melody in your hearts to the Lord. It says nothing even about counterpoint, says nothing about musical scales, because that's cultural. That shifts over culture. And God gives us freedom in our culture to use the instruments that fit our culture to carry out the never-changing message of the hymns, the psalms, and even the spiritual odes that are written to worship the Lord. And once we understand that we have freedom in form in music, it at least helps those who are emotionally tied in with certain forms in music to accept the fact that God has given people freedom to worship the Lord with different types of instrumentality. And so I, I think those who are a cappella today miss that cultural dimension in the Old Testament and why there are instruments, why there are no instruments in the New Testament, because the gospel now is going to the whole world. And of course, I, I think about services where um, where people uh, do some really beautiful blending in comes of worship. And you'll sing a hymn, and then and then sometimes you'll sing that hymn, and you won't have any instruments in the background. And in the midst of the shift, um, there there oftentimes is something very beautiful that happens in. Um, singing something in which there is instrumentation and support, and then the next moment it's just the voices, uh, and 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 that flexibility 
um, is part of the beauty of what God has designed for us in the way in which we creatively apply the fact that we're – I tell people when we're made in the image of God, we're made to think, analyze, and be creative in, po- in a positive sense. That's, that's what God is in his character. And we can bring that to our worship, and when we bring that to our worship, we open up avenues for the different personalities that are in the audience, some of whom are attracted um, in, in one way to God and others of whom are attracted in another way to God. We also build our ability to appreciate that difference with and among one another as we, in unity, share God together in our walk with God together. And I I think that that harmony, if I can use a picture, um, is important for the church. Um, Everybody's not exactly the same. We all have different gifts that we bring to the body of Christ to complement one another and to collaborate together. Collaboration was at the core of the creation. You know, I tell people, God didn't promote the creation to being very good till he put the woman next to the man and they were collaborating together and supposed to take care of the garden together well. And uh, so all that fits in theologically at the core of what we're supposed to be as a community. Yeah, and I agree 100 percent. I just reflected back on my experience in Nigeria because when Musa opened the uh, session with those 600 people, pastors and wives, we sang some traditional uh, American hymns that had been brought over there when they did missions. And then... When Musa took over to talk about form, they restructured. They had a group of women and men come forward, and they segued into their African instruments Hmm. and and their beat and their chants, and it was a beautiful demonstration of freedom and form. Hmm. I think the only problem that we made in missions is we too quickly took our forms over there in hymns and songs rather than encouraging them to develop their own styles in order to worship. They were doing both, though, and it was beautiful. Yeah, well, Gene, this is the first segment. We're going to take a break here and and do a second half that's for um, the other part of what we do in the table. We're in the process of splitting uh, our podcasts into that which we offer for free and that which we're putting behind a, a, a subscription wall that we're calling DTS Plus. And so when we come back, we'll, we're going to talk about a, in a little more detail um, some of the principles of leadership and discipleship that you um, – that you um, think are foundational, and and I'd like for you to address for us um, how you think pastors in today's um, swirling cultural climate, I think that's the only way to describe it, um, can lead the church well in a situation which pastors are under terrific pressure because of what's going on around them. So we'll be back on the the other half. We thank you for joining us on the table, and we hope you'll join us uh, for part two. For listening to the Table Podcast. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth, love well.